This presentation is titled, The Character of Christ, An Easter Message. Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, Jesus was at his perfect best when things were at their worst in Gethsemane and Calvary. There could have been no atonement without the character of Christ. I would like to consider a few attributes and characteristics of Christ that enabled him to accomplish the atonement and, sur and the resurrection. Or in other words, let's examine his character. Number one, his obedience in honoring his father and his mother. In 3 Nephi 27, 13 through 14, as the Savior is speaking to the Nephite people on the American continent, he gives us this insight into why he came and did what he did. Behold, I have given unto you my gospel, and this is the gospel which I give unto you, that I came into the world to do the will of my Father. Why? Because my Father sent me, and my Father sent me, that I might be lifted upon the cross, and after that I had been lifted upon the cross, that I might draw all men unto me, that as I have been lifted up by men, even so should men be lifted up by the Father to stand before me to be judged of their works, whether they be good or whether they be evil. Christ came because he loved his parents, because my Father sent me. That's why he came. Oh, how grateful we are to his obedience and honoring his father and mother and their wishes. How well do I honor my heavenly father and mother and my obedience? And maybe as just a side note to the ironic priesthood holders, if you're thinking of going on a mission and you're not sure to go, but your parents want you to go, well, that was good enough for Christ. Go because your parents sent you. That's why Christ came. If it's good enough for him, it's good enough for us. Number two, his willingness to live the law of sacrifice. In John chapter 10, verses 17 through 18, we read these very important words. Therefore doth my Father love me, Christ speaking, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Do you see the implications of these verses? This is the whole crux of Christianity. No one, in a real sense, kills Christ. Oh, they seek to, and they offer him up, and they nail him to a cross. But, brothers and sisters, he had power to stop it all or to stay there or whatever. He was a God. Christ willingly gave his life. No man takes it from him. That's the whole point. This was truly an eternal sacrifice by a God. He willingly gave his life. Perhaps I too can live the law of sacrifice where I am willing to lay down the things of the world for a far better glory in God's kingdom. Number three, his divine courage. Christ knowingly walks towards Gethsemane and the cross. Have you ever considered that and thought about that? When he goes to Jerusalem for the last time, he knows the consequences of his actions. He knows what the result will be. He knows they will seek and lust after his life. How easy it would have been to turn and just have gone somewhere else. And he could have avoided it all. But no Christ in his divine courage walks knowingly into Gethsemane and to the cross for you and me. Am I willing to face my Gethsemanes with such divine courage? Number four, his unwavering submissiveness and divine determination. 
the ability to say the word nevertheless. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 29 through 39, I'm sorry, that probably should be 29 through 30, it says, And he, Christ, went a little further and fell on his face, and praying, saying, O Father, if it be possible, let this cap pass from me. Notice how intense the pain is. He falls on his face, praying, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And what is the answer to his prayer? Do you see it? That's right, there is no answer. He, like you and I in mortality, also prayed and received no immediate answer to his prayers. Yet he does not become offended and wondering where God is and why hasn't he answered me and does he not care? No, he continues in faith in what he already knows. And he has the courage and unwavering, submissive and divine determination to say, Nevertheless, Father, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And we learn in Doctrine and Covenants 19, 18 through 19, that decision says, which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain and to bleed at every pore and to suffer both body and spirit that I might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. Nevertheless, glory be to the Father. And I partook and finished my preparations unto the children of men. Oh, if it was not for that unwavering submissiveness and divine determination, brothers and sisters, might he have not yielded and said nevertheless. Maybe I too can learn to say nevertheless in submitting my will to the will of the Father. Number five, his ability to look outward while facing incomprehensible suffering. While on the cross, he is facing some of the most physical suffering mankind has inflicted upon mankind. And while on the cross, he sees his mother and the disciple John, and he has concern for his mother. While on the cross, going through that immense pain, he is more worried about his mother who is now going to be alone and whether she's going to be taken care of. And that's where we learn in the book of John, where he looks down and says, My son, meaning John, behold thy mother, and mother, behold thy son. John, would you please take care of her and make sure she's okay? I am going to be gone, and I have other work to do. His ability to look outward and be concerned about others while in the midst of his own intense suffering. What character? Do I tend to turn inward, or can I turn outward when suffering my afflictions? Number six, his faith in his Father and his plan. While on the cross, Brother McConkie tells us that all of the pain and suffering of Gethsemane comes back upon him for a time. And that is what causes the Savior to yell out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In the midst of reoccurring suffering of Gethsemane while on the cross, Heavenly Father again withdraws his spirit from him and leaves the Savior alone. In essence, the Savior saying, What? I have to go through this a second time? which seems to indicate he did not anticipate that. And yet, instead of being shaken, instead of being offended at his father, instead of complaining and begrudging his father, he has complete faith and submits to whatever the father seeth fit to inflict upon him. 
I too can place my faith in the Father's plan for me when I feel all alone and distraught. Number seven, his self-control. What a great attribute that enabled him to accomplish this mighty atonement. While on the cross, Matthew 27, verses 29 through 42, give us the following of what some of them said to him. And they that passed by reviled him, Jesus, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him, and the scribes and the elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save, if he be the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. That had to have stung and hurt if... If I'm the Son of God, he knew who he was. He had a sure witness. And here they are mocking him and tempting him to prove that. Yet Christ does not have to prove who he is. How easy he could have showed them if he could have done some miraculous thing. But he leaves them to their own devices. How well is my self-control in the midst of conflict and persecution? Number eight, finally, his integrity. Christ, before the foundations of the earth, forever coming, covenanted with his Father and with us, that he would overcome physical and spiritual death, that he would break the bands of death, and the grave and redeem our souls from hell. So in Luke 24, 5 through 6, when it says to Mary, when she comes to the tomb, one of the angels says, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Oh, how those words are so glorious. He kept his word, his integrity. Christ endured to the end in faith and kept his covenants so that we may one day live again. Will I too be true to my covenants and endure to the end? Oh, how grateful I am for Christ and his character. These are but a few of the character of Christ that enabled him to accomplish the mighty atonement and resurrection. We sing all hell to Jesus' name as the great Jehovah who came to save us from the grave and hell. We sing and we shout, Hosanna to God and the Lamb. Glory be to the Father forever and ever. I testify that Christ lives, and oh, what comfort that sweet sentence does give. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and considered a few things concerning this Easter season. If you enjoyed it, hit the like button and consider subscribing to my channel.